on this new format. Everyone has a role to play in social distancing. We are no exception. This new format gives us the ability to share the briefings more widely while minimising the number of people in government offices. The well-being of our journalists is important to us. We know that we need to get the information out to all corners of the island in what is a fast-moving situation. I have with me today, off camera for the moment, the Minister for Health and Social Care, and we are also joined today by Kath Quilliam, who is our Director of Nursing. Before I hand over, them, over to them today, I would like to share with you what happened in Timwald today. As part of our democratic process, where emergency orders are made, Timwald needs to confirm these at the earliest opportunity. This is what we did this morning. Timwald confirmed that the powers in relation to our ability to enforce self-isolation, the closure of places like pubs, clubs, cinemas and betting shops, and the delay to the by-election in Douglas South caused by the passing of Bill Malarkey. I am grateful to members of Timwald for their engagement at this time. National unity is important. I am the first Chief Minister to have had to invoke these emergency powers. But as I told Timwald, this is not something of which I am proud. I believe in democracy. I believe in liberty. It was with a heavy heart that I asked for these powers, but it was the right thing to do. I also made a statement to update Timwald. I would like to summarise three of what I think are the most important points. First, that this is the greatest challenge faced by the island in living memory. There is no clear end in sight, but there will be an end. How far in the future is unclear to everyone. The greatest nations on the planet are struggling. Life cannot be the same for the foreseeable future. The second point, as government we have put in place measures to protect our health and social care system, to protect our most vulnerable and to protect your families. We have closed places where people congregate. We have closed our borders to all but our returning residents. The Treasury Minister has announced a package of measures that we hope will help to protect our economy and our workers. If we have to do more, then we will. But our resources are finite and we have to ensure we are doing the right thing at the right time. Third, government cannot do this alone. In Timwald, I called on our people, everyone who holds this island dear, to play their part. This will require resilience and resolve, two things that the Isle of Man is famous for. I have faith that you will do our nation proud, and most people already are. The measures we already have in place, if respected, will make a difference. But I made it clear in Timwald that if people do not respect the advice on stopping social gatherings, or our plea to stay at home, wherever possible, we will bring in more powers to legally enforce this. In the United Kingdom, this has already happened. Our officers are working on plans to finalise for us, for us to do the same. We will be ready to bring in these measures if and when required. My message today is clear. The public have 24 hours to change their behaviour. Tell your friends, tell your families, tell your colleagues. We also need businesses to do their bit. They need to practice and enforce the highest level of social distancing. Many are doing so, for which I thank them. Some are still not. If it becomes clear that shops are becoming the weak link in our measures, then we will have to move to close them. I would now like to hand over to the Minister for Health and Social Care and our Director of Nursing for an update on testing on so and on some of the changes we are making with primary care and where we are more generally on medical and social care provision. David. Thank you very much, Chief Minister. 
Turning to testing first of all, since the press conference yesterday there has been a further 10 positive results back, now making a total of 23. All are what will be classified as mild cases and are recovering at home with no hospital admissions. The breakdown in terms of travel history is of the 23 confirmed cases, we have 11 who have travel history and we have 12 that have no travel history, which clearly shows there is a spread in the community. In total, we've had 284 tests back now, with 23 positive, as I've just stated, and we are awaiting the results of a further 203 tests. The, te the positive cases are across all age ranges, with the youngest being in their early 20s and the oldest case confirmed being 75. And I emphasise again at the moment, all cases are mild and have not required hospital treatment. But it does reinforce exactly what the Chief Minister has just stated about social distancing measures. For those that are, are, are actually practising social distancing, I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you. But to the minority who are not, um, if things continue, then as the Chief Minister has stated, stronger action will be required. In terms of primary care, I have several announcements. Firstly, non-urgent dentistry has stopped and all routine appointments for the next three months have been cancelled. Anyone that requires urgent dental attention will be triaged over the phone to see if they qualify for that attention. In terms of the GP's surgeries, as many people will know, the promenade GP practice was due to It will now be closed early and instead will be used to provide essential services such as childhood immunisations. All GP practices will be introducing telephone and video consultations. No one should be attending their GP surgery unless they are required and told to do so. If you show any symptoms of COVID-19, then your route, of course, is the 111 line. In terms of cancer care, I need to make some announcements as well. We may be in contact with some patients who are due to have cancer surgery to bring forward their procedure. We will be, con we will be doing that on a risk basis and we'll be contacting those patients shortly. In relation to cancer screening, the UK has stopped their screening programmes and that therefore has had a direct knock-on effect to our programmes and our cancer screening has also now stopped and all patients are now being notified. Many of the UK centres are making decisions that directly affect Isle of Man residents and will be calling their patients directly. This includes Clatterbridge Cancer Centre. Can I reinforce the message I made the other day that if anyone has appointments booked with UK hospitals, can they please contact the UK hospital direct rather than contacting us here on Ireland because we may not have that information to be able to assist. It'll be much quicker and much better if patients contact the UK hospital treating them directly. So we will also be risk assessing all the patients who have been receiving treatment in the UK over the period of the next few weeks to work out what treatments we can deliver on Ireland and what we need to do to help them. It is an anonymous undertaking for us and I ask that people are patient with us while we work through it. So we ask again that people please, if they've got appointments with UK hospitals, they contact those hospitals directly, not nobles. And if I can now hand over to our Director of Nursing, Kath Quillian. Good afternoon, I'm Kath Quillian, Director of Nursing. I want to start with a very simple message, a plea. We are staying at work for you. Please follow the advice, stay home if you can, social distance and wash your hands frequently. This will help us to keep you safe. Health and social care services are under unprecedented pressure at the moment. It is crucial that together we prevent excess demand at any one time. Everyone can do their bit. The statistics on social distancing are compelling. If we all practice social distancing, we can reduce the number of infections 
by 20% in a single day. What does that mean for health and social care services? Put simply, fewer people will come through our services and our workforce, which is under pressure, will be better able to cope. I represent the nursing and care profession. Our nurses and care workers are doing the island proud every day. They have been endlessly adaptable and flexible, taking on new challenges and roles, using every ounce of their training and insight and experience to help us manage the whole health and care system prepare for an influx of patients and keep essential services running when everyone is stepping up. We're moving fast to maximise what we can do with what we've got. Many student nurses on our nursing degree course have moved into senior healthcare assistant roles, taking on frontline duties in extraordinary circumstances. They are competent to carry out all of the duties that they are performing and are being supervised in their roles. I'm delighted to say they are performing brilliantly and enjoying their work. They are our future and we can be very proud that this is so. It is why we grow our own nurses, training the workforce of the future here on Ireland. With the release of nursing staff from areas in which we've suspended services such as non-urgent outpatient clinics and preventative services, we have been able to expand our workforce. We've moved nurses in high-risk groups and brought other nurses forward to work in higher risk areas. Organising nursing capability throughout the whole health and care system is a daily logistical exercise but we are managing it. It's been hugely pleasing to see a number of former nurses and midwives who have retired or left the profession come forward offering their help where they can. I am getting calls every day and I thank everybody for those offers. Nurses and midwives who have retired in the last three years will be able to join the Nursing and Midwifery Council COVID-19 Temporary Register as soon as the UK Government passes emergency legislation to allow this. At the same time, our HR colleagues are reaching out to former nursing staff on Ireland to see if they are able to join us. I want to use this opportunity to reinforce that it's crucially important that all members of society practice social distancing. There has rightly been focus on older people and people in vulnerable groups, but we should not underestimate the risk to our young people. They are not immune or invincible. Everyone should practice social distancing to help the health and social care system cope. To that end, as I begun, we're staying at work for you. Please help us to help you by following the advice. Social distancing all the time, everywhere, by everyone. Social isolate when required and wash your hands frequently. Well, thank you, David and Kath. And Kath, please pass on our thanks to all of us, um, to your nursing colleagues. They, along with colleagues in social care and in the community, are on the front line. Kath's presentation, I hope, has brought home to people the enormity of the challenge ahead of us. There is a simple and stark reality ahead of us. I would like to add a point that is important to me about the work being done in the community. For example, now that all day services have closed, the situation of each vulnerable individual is being assessed to map out the support that is needed in their homes so they can ensure they are fully supported. The assessment includes looking at who needs physical and mental health support and how best we can use technology to support. There is a raft of work underway between colleagues in health and social care and community groups 
that is important to recognise. There is too much going on to be able to mention everything, but I would like to personally thank our third sector partners for stepping up and working with us hand in glove for the good of our most vulnerable. The, the greatest contribution each of us can make for our island community in the coming weeks is this, stay at home. There are not many ways to put it. If people do not follow the advice, then they are putting lives at risk. Maybe their own, maybe that of a loved one, maybe a health professional. But they will be certainly be putting at risk the most, the most vulnerable members of our society. These are real people whose lives depend on all of us acting responsible and acting resp taking responsibility, all of us. I will now take questions. And Tim, I think from Manx Radio, you're first. Yes, Tim Glover from Manx Radio, fast am I. Um, just picking up on that very last point, uh, because we saw with just one non-travel case report, and I think it was only two days ago, if I remember correctly, it's moving that fast. We saw very drastic changes. Um, we've had reports today that many footpaths, uh, of course, that run through agricultural land, it was from a farmer asking the question if he had to self-isolate. He was calling ready for the footpaths to close beauty spots, glens and beaches, because we've already had the food shopping, haven't we? The loo rolls, pasta, sterilizers and tin food. People don't seem to be listening. Isn't it time maybe to not even wait 24 hours? Well, we're giving people 24 hours to change their way. If, if they don't, then I will be back here tomorrow making different announcements, which I hope I don't have to do. But yes, I went down around Douglas yesterday myself in the afternoon to have a look and quite a few of the shops were being really sensible and the, the social um, distancing was working really well. But then I, I went to some bigger stores and it clearly wasn't working well and people weren't um, adhering to it. And I was getting complaints from members of the public who had spoken to people to point that out to them and they were just being told to be quiet. So that's why all the speeches you've had today have been clearly stating to people, you must self-isolate, you must keep your distance from people, and if you don't, then we will have to take draconian action that none of us want to do. And if I could, uh, just with my second question, uh, ask the Health Minister, so I know it's a bit of a tight squeeze oh, there. David, uh... do you want to come in? Hello, Tim. Um, First of my um, 11 travel related cases, 12 no travel now. So clearly uh, it's taking a, a bit of a hold within the community. Um, do we have more people waiting for tests than we've actually got test kits? Because we've heard of some people having to wait three days before a test. It's to do with capacity, Tim, and yes, there is capacity around the swabbing. As I stated at the start, we were aiming for 30 tests a day, which is significantly more than what the UK is doing with their population in terms of per head of population. It's about five times more, actually, than what the UK is doing. Um, but we do want to do more testing, and so we are sourcing kits from far afield worldwide um, to try and relieve pressure off the NHS supply chain. But there is going to be a couple of days where we do have an issue in terms of being able to keep up with demand but we were expecting that in the first place one of the things I need to point out about the cases that are developed in the community um, I believe in relation to four of those cases they're actually one household so it's the same household but it is clear it is spreading in the community there is spread there and as I pointed out with the age ranges it affects everyone it affects young people right the way up to our oldest case, which is 75 so far. So everyone needs to practice that social distancing. OK, thank you very much for that, David. Leanne we, um, from 3FM, do you have your questions? Hi, Chief Minister. Hi, so Leanne. my question is just for key workers who can't work from home what advice you'd give to them in order to adhere to self-isolation guidelines and perhaps what practices are in place to protect them? Well, if you're a key worker, obviously make sure you do the social distancing first and foremost, so that's two metres or six feet, keeping people away from you. Regularly wash your hands. And I suppose it's just a case of 
being sensible, depending on the job you do, the um, health department are giving advice. If, if you're working on frontline services and our health and social care, then obviously there will be the full kit and, and what is needed. But if anyone has any concerns about what they need to do, then they should be going on, on our helpline to get the latest advice. And my second question is for the Health and Social Care Minister. Okay, David. Hello, Leanne. Hi, David. Um, my question is, the UK has been talking about using other facilities if the NHS and hospitals become overwhelmed. I just wondered if that's something that the island would consider doing if nobles can't cope with the capacity of people. As I've said previously, there's various plans um, being looked at, and one of those is if we do need to expand capacity. We've already been looking at plans, quite rightly, around our ITU capacity, and they are well advanced now, but we do have other plans as well. The important thing is, as a health service, we have plans for various different phases and various different scenarios, and people can rest assured that we have planned those out should spread increase. But one of the reasons we are driving community testing, and it's important to emphasise this, the point of community testing is to try and break that chain. As Gregor said at the press conference yesterday, the point of testing is to quickly identify, break the chain, not necessarily to treat people because people who are mild cases obviously simply self-isolate until the symptoms pass. It's about identifying the cases early in the community so they don't end up as mass spread. Thank you. And be before you go, Leanne, I think it's worth pointing out that we won't need to do that if the public listen to the concerns of our professional healthcare workers. We've been bringing different people on at different times to get the message over. Keep your distance from people two metres or six feet, wash your hands with hot soapy water on a regular basis and self-isolate if, if you need to. And if the public keep to those rules properly, we will not have our hospitals swamped. But if it's broken, that's what could happen and we will then have to bring in other measures which the Health Minister has just described. So now it's over to Paul at um, MTTV, Mr Moulton. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Quayle, Paul Moulton, MTTV News. I'm concerned possibly that you're sending a mixed message out. You're saying stay at home, yet you've got the shops still open, the ones that aren't, aren't obviously essential ones. Um, I, I've been down there today and people have been very responsible outside shops. Big queues were forming, but that, the queues were very well balanced in the sense that they, they were being two metres apart. Surely this is not London, this is not a, a Boris situation where they have to make a blanket ban shutting those other shops because they are putting money back into the economy, which I think is important from everyone's point of view. If there is one bad apple, surely it's just a point of, it's just shut that one store down, if there is still one by the end of today, rather than being draconian and shutting all the shops and therefore stopping the spend of money, or do you actually want to keep to the message of stay at home? Well, first and foremost, it's the health of the people of the Isle of Man. Yes, the, the economy is credibly important, Paul, but my number one concern is saving lives of the people of the Isle of Man and ensuring that we are as healthy as possible. That's the first concern. After that, it is the, obviously the economy. So we will be taking advice from our medical experts on how we should be going forward, but that is why we are trying to enable people to have where possible some sort of normality of life but if they stick to the rules of staying at home unless they need to go out for supplies for food keeping their distance from people and we've said time and time again the six feet or the two meter rule washing their hands on a regular basis then this will work if they don't and the medics give us concerns that the figures are are not where we would want them to be then obviously we will have to bring in other rules and regulations and my second question is really one that's come from people who have constantly been on to me. And I, I want to clarify, and I think maybe you, this is a chance for you to do it. If people have come in contact with someone that has then has to self-isolate and therefore they self-isolate and they've got a job that they can't do at home, are they on the sick? Do they get compensation for self-isolating because they have to and they can't carry on with their work? If people have to self-isolate and their company does not provide for sick pay as part of the contract, then they will be entitled to claim sick benefit for the 14 days from the government. If 
they go home and the company um, do pay them their salary, then the company will be entitled to get recompense from the government as help towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, next I have Josh from ITV. Thank you, Chief Minister. Um, given the UK has now effectively implemented a lockdown protocol, is it now not a case of if, but more of a case of when for the Isle of Man to follow suit? And if so, what would it take for that to happen? Right, well, obviously, we're monitoring this closely. And I, and I would say, in, in effect, we could be more locked down than the United Kingdom already because they have not closed their borders. People are still able to come in to the United Kingdom. We have already closed our borders to all but um, essential travel of local people coming home and key workers. But obviously, I have major meetings every day, and every, uh, every day at 9 o'clock I have the National Strategy Group meeting. We will be discussing the latest evidence put to us from our health experts and making decisions tomorrow, and obviously we'll be announcing um, the feedback at um, 4 o'clock tomorrow. And my second question, uh, many people have been in touch with me today about young people in particular and how there seems to still be many young people who may not be taking the virus seriously. I'm just wondering if you've got a message particularly to young people who may feel the virus may not greatly affect them and is there a better way that, to get the message across to young people in particular? Well, if they're under 18, then I would hope that their parents are giving them as much um, advice as, as possible. I think young people need to realise that they may not have severe symptoms of this illness, but they could then pass it on to a, an elderly grandparent who could die as a result of their irresponsibility. So I'm sure all young people love their grandparents. They love their, their parents who may have an autoimmune system or they might have an older sister who's pregnant where they could um, cause the death of someone who's vulnerable there. So that's the messaging. However, I, I have to say that yesterday I took time out to see for myself just how the, the social distancing was working out in the shops. And um, I went to one large retail area, which I won't mention, and I saw people, adults, clearly not complying properly with the rules and regulations. So it, whilst we may uh, be quick to point the finger at young people, um, adults are just as bad from what I'm seeing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua. Um, Chris, we've got you next from Energy FM. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. Many people will be carrying out their own self-isolation period, and there are also those who will be too scared to leave the house. What can you tell those people about how well the government guidelines are being followed and how well we're doing at policing those who choose to ignore them? Well, I've spoke today to the Attorney General to make sure that he can work on legislation to bring in even further um, on, on the spot fines that if people aren't adhering to these social distancing, etc., then we will be bringing in um, penalties for people. I, th I think it's time that people realise we mean business. We've meant business from day one, but if you're going to abuse it, we've already got the powers to, if people break their um, isolation um, rules and regulations, then we can fine people up to £10,000 or three months in prison or a combination of both. So there are some tough powers out there. Timbald has accepted these powers. Um, we've, all, we've already had them in place through our emergency powers through the 1936 Act, but we will be enforcing this very rigorously. rigorously. So people staying at home, we are doing our very best. Yes, we have a number of cases, but we have the very best planning that's gone in from our health and social care department. Our teachers are working hard there at the frontline services too, looking after the young people that need um, looking after so that the, the parents can go out and provide those key services, whether it's um, on a till selling us the food that we need to eat or fixing the central heating or a burst pipe or getting the electricity back on or the police or, or the medical profession. So an awful lot of work is going on behind the scenes to make sure that we are as safe as possible. If people follow the advice that we're giving time and time again, we will get through this well. And to the Health Minister, Mr okay, Ashford, what is the requirement to get tested? Because I've heard numerous uh, reports of people with full symptoms of coronavirus being told on the 111 helpline 
to continue to self-isolate and not get tested. In terms of testing, if they are symptomatic, they will be tested. Um, so I'm not sure where you've heard those reports, Chris, because I've not heard any. I have heard of people who, when I've checked into it, they don't meet the criteria of symptoms to be tested. They personally think they should be tested, but they don't meet the actual criteria for COVID-19. So if you're referring to those sort of cases, that is why with 111, we actually have it clinically staffed because people will be assessed on a clinical basis. So it's not a call centre, it's a clinical line, COVID-111, and it's the clinicians that then make a clinical <coughs> judgment on whether someone meets the criteria as to whether or not they should be tested. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Chris. Um, Alex from the BBC. Hello there, hi. Um, hi Alex. First question is to Miss Quilliam, please. Um, okay. I'd just like to just like to obviously start by passing on sincere thanks on behalf of the BBC and the public to all of the, your nurses for putting in the per perseverance and time here. As a nurse who understands more than most of the conditions on the front line of nursing and hospital care, how prepared in staffing and resources do you believe Nobles Hospital is for an influx of serious cases? I think we're as prepared as we can be. We're not just preparing for the next couple of days, we're looking three, four weeks ahead. As I said before, uh, we are looking at the whole health and social care system. For example, we have um, done a skills analysis of every nurse on the island. So for example, if we've got an ED nurse who's currently working in the community, uh, they will be coming into ED to help. So we've done a lot of preparation, not just for the immediate time, but for two and three, four weeks down the line. So I think we're as Thank you. Prepared as we can. Thank you. Um, and a second question for the Chief Minister, please. Okay, and if I can um, say, Alex, we have been working for a long time now on this. This hasn't just suddenly happened in the last week. Obviously, since this started, we've been planning behind the scenes for a long, long time. Thank you. We heard Ms Quilliam earlier there tell us that social isolation, if people adhere to it, uh, lowers the risk by 20% every day it's enforced. That's substantial. Now, you've threatened to make the island man follow in line with the uk or further by implementing what you say is dracon draconian action now would you accept that with every day that passes by without stricter measures imposed on people's movements the risk of contagion increases and if so why would the isle of man not choose to enforce a lockdown at this stage well we take advice from our medical experts alex obviously we we are working on putting together all the necessary procedures to lock the island down and if we have to we will so it really is based on the advice from the professionals that we get and whilst we are doing that and waiting for that advice we are putting in in place the measures to enable us to do it because it's not just a case of announcing something you have to make sure that all your vulnerable people are prepared and that if you're going to do something then you, you have measures in place behind the scenes to make it work thank you Thank you very much. Um, and finally, Sam from Alaman Newspapers. Sam, nice to see you. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Mr Ashford, that's okay, please. Okay, David. Good afternoon, Sam. Good afternoon. Uh, how are you? Very well. Good question, by the way. Uh, last week, we were told the island has six ventilators. The mm. UK, uh, Matt Hancock is saying they've added 7,000. Obviously, we're not looking at that scale, but how many has the island managed to add in that time? So at the moment, I believe we've expanded our capacity at the moment to 10 um, that are available for use. We are also working with NHS supply chain, as I think it was yesterday's press conference I pointed out, to uh, get more. But it's also very important to emphasise it's not just around getting ventilators. It's about training the staff up to be able to operate the ventilators as well. So you can have absolutely thousands of ventilators, but you need to have the staff to be able to run them. And what um, I need to emphasise as well, we also need to have the isolation areas for that to be able to run. So it's an entire operation. But we oh, have... But we are also we are also looking um, further afield as well at other countries who have fi have come forward to offer to help us. And um, the second be for the uh, chief minister, if that's okay, please. Okay, can I point out when we're mentioning thousands of respirators for the United Kingdom, that's for a population of over sixty million. So, um, let's put this in context of the numbers that we have and the training that we've done. Okay, Sam. 
Oh, absolutely. Well, the second one was hopefully building on a point that Mr. Cannon raised that um, businesses on the island may be able to they be able to access funds if they want to diversify their company. Has there been any contact with um, manufacturing companies on the island about making ventilators on island as opposed to having to rely on supplies from off from England, as it were? No, we haven't um, contacted. We, we think the size of the um, factories on the Isle of Man, it would be difficult for them to do it. In the UK, they've got tens of thousands of people working in these factories and they would be able to quickly um, alter their production line to make it as efficient as, as possible. If we felt we had a concern, then obviously that's something we can revisit. But at this moment in time, we, we haven't, Sam. Um... Okay, thank you. OK, well, thank you all very much for coming. I hope this new format has worked, it, if it keeps the members of our press safe so they're not having to be in a, in a small room together, then that has to be a good thing. And I um, look forward to speaking to you all tomorrow. Thank you very much.